Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, may I welcome our guests today. We have Di Alexander, Chair of Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, Elizabeth Layton, Policy Advisor and Secretariat of the Existing Homes Alliance Scotland, Professor David Sigsworth, former Chair of the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group, and Norman Kerr, Director of Energy Action Scotland. May I first of all welcome our guests. Good morning. And we'll move into evidence from them slightly later on in the session. May I ask all those present to turn off or switch to silent any electronic devices that might interfere with proceedings. Uh, I have apologies from Dean Lockhart at this stage, and I think Jackie Bailey, uh, if you could come in at this point. Declaration of interest and refer um, colleagues to my register of interest. I'm the honorary vice president of Energy Action Scotland. Thank you for that. The first decision of uh, on the agenda is item number one, which is to take the items four, five, and six in private. Are we agreed that they should be taken in private? Yes. Um, the second item on the agenda is a decision to take certain business in private which is to do with the draft report to the Finance Committee on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2017 to 18, and also draft letters to the Scottish and UK governments on the inquiry on the economic impact of leaving the European Union. And it is to take these in private at future meetings. Are we agreed on that? Yes. <clears throat> so we'll now come to our evidence session. and. Um, Having welcomed our guests, I would like to start with uh, a general question to the panel, and also should I, uh, I should say that if you wish to come in at any point, if you simply indicate that by raising your hand, and then I'll seek to, to bring you in, and the sound desk will deal with your microphone and uh, switching microphones to those committee members for asking questions and so forth. Um, the first question I'd like to put to the panel is, what um, would you like to see in the Scottish Government budget and what do you consider as realistic that could be provided for in the upcoming budget? Perhaps I'll start from left to right uh, with Di Alexander, first of all. Um, I would like to see um, a priority given um, to um, ensuring that vulnerable households uh, in off and off-gas areas, uh, that priority is given to vulnerable households and off-gas areas in terms of achieving affordable warmth outcomes to um, for the households concerned, uh, which will bring other benefits, which I. Um, uh, touched on earlier. Um, in terms of the amount of money, um, I mean, you know, we live in the real world. Um, that is why I lay emphasis on where the priorities should go. Um, but you, I think that I agree with the conclusions of the um, strategic working group about the overall levels of funding which we really should be aiming for if we're going to make a serious inroad into the, the what is essentially the flat lining of the fuel poverty stats and get them to come down in the in the meaningful way that we need thank you and i think you say touched on earlier you've um your group has done a report on matters hasn't it uh, yes, sorry, Chair, yes, I, I, um, absolutely. Um, the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force was set up by Scottish Government to come up with an action plan, um, um, uh, uh, which is basically finding um, pr practicable, deliverable solutions to all aspects um, of the fuel poverty stroke affordable warmth problem, which is at its most acute in rural and particularly in remote rural Scotland. That is what we did. Um, and the world doesn't stand still, but we think it is a very good basis uh, for uh, on which government uh, can and should act. And Elizabeth Layton? Um, yes, I should. I just wanted to introduce my 
my sort of two hats that I'm wearing today. I am um, supporting the existing Homes Alliance, and I'll, I'll answer your question in that capacity. But I also um, had the privilege of being the policy advisor to the Strategic Working Group and was heavily involved in the drafting of that report. So you'll forgive me if sometimes I might stray into answering some questions on, the, on that side. Um, but in answer to your question, the existing Homes Alliance does have a clear ask in terms of what we think the Scottish budget um, should be reflecting in terms of support on, um, on energy efficiency, because that is our, our focus. We are a coalition of environmental, housing, and anti-poverty groups that believe that raising the energy performance of our housing stock has a multitude of benefits, particularly in terms of fuel poverty and climate change. But with my other hat, I recognize there is much more to be done. Um, we believe that, that um, the budget needs to meet the ambition in terms of raising our housing stock to an energy performance certificate scale of um, band C, which is um, recognized as supported in the Strategic Working Group report, as well as the National Institute for Clinical Excellence recommendation um, in terms of health concerns from cold and damp homes. That, um, in order to achieve that ambition, we've estimated that it, it is a big cost. And overall, um, over a 10-year program, that would cost um, £10 billion. Pounds. Now, of course, all of that mustn't come from the public purse, but enough has to be brought in from the public sector to leverage in private finance as well. And so for this year, which is a transitional year before the Scotland's energy efficiency program is launched in 2018, we've called for uh, the budget to be at 190 million with an assumed 60 million coming from the energy company obligation. That's an estimate, um, bringing the budget to 250 million, um, which we think would is the necessary amount you need to scale up our efforts to raise the performance of the homes and to be able to leverage in the private funding. And so alongside that budget, so that we're making best use of that public funding, we need a package of regulation of carrots and sticks, regulation and incentives, so that you're getting the, the enough of a, a push and a, a pull for those who are able to pay to take action using some of their own funds. So I hope that's a, a lot. Uh, well, uh, one other point I'd like to make is that we think that there are opportunities to, in a sense, make make best use of some other parts of the budget, you know, and kind of sweat our assets a bit more to address the fuel poverty concerns. And so that would be looking at our broad range of welfare powers at the social security system and about how benefits, not just the winter fuel payment, but our broader benefits, such as um, ill health and disability payments and others, could be aligned to meet fuel poverty objectives, because it may be that those people have additional needs in terms of affordable warmth. And we think the energy company obligation that we have new powers and how that is used could be better integrated with SEEP so that it is a more efficient delivery of the program. OK, I'll stop there. Professor Sigsworth. Uh, my role um, recently was to chair the Strategic Working Group on Pure Poverty. And I think my uh, conclusions about budget stem from our recommendations. And our document gave a new framework for addressing fuel poverty in Scotland, given that the targets we set ourselves in 2001 uh, did not were not met. In fact, uh, things were twice as bad um, at that point uh, when we're in November this year as they had been 15 years earlier. So we wanted to see a different momentum, a different policy implemented. And we don't want to see the momentum on getting into and delivering that policy halted. We don't want a hiatus. And so, first of all, we're looking for a clear timetable and a clear process for first of all responding to our report and to the rural poverty report, but also to actually putting the milestones in place for its, um, uh, uh, for its monitoring. Uh, 
And what do we want to see then now, straight away, and what would want to be embodied in budgets for this coming year? Well, there are a number of pieces of policy that will be need to integrate to deliver our proposals. One in particular is the... Um, uh, the, the, the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme, which is being consulted on now, it certainly isn't expected to run, I don't believe, in, in its full guise uh, for some time yet, but there are a number of pilots. And I'd certainly like to see pilots um, uh, involved in this budgeting process, which experiment with and extend the experience we have of the main underlying change that we're looking for in our report, which is to move from the main focus of fuel poverty eradication being a single central programme for energy efficiency improvement. And we're not saying let's stop it, we'd like to see that increased. But we're saying that that in itself will not eradicate fuel poverty. 15 years of experience have told us that. But we need it, we need more, and we need more because of the climate change implications. But we are suggesting a number of community-based actions that are required with primary health care, with the social care services, local authorities, um, and, and others who will, in collaboration, uh, deliver the new programme we've outlined. So, we're going to see budgets that need to be increased over time to actually move towards both the objectives that are outlined for better energy efficiency, but we also want to see the budgets associated with those other areas that influence fuel poverty policy, recognising that they're going to have to make commitments. We also want to see those programmes in the short term focusing on the disadvantage, the most disadvantaged, that's not been necessarily the case, albeit that has been a movement we've been making towards that objective for the last couple of years. In the medium term, and I think this does in fact, in, in fact in, in, invoke budget issues, there's a number of new policies that the government is either consulting on or considering, and that's the energy efficiency programme I've just talked about, the climate change plan, the new energy strategy that's um, uh, been talked about now, and the Fairer Scotland plan. We would like to see in the budgeting there's a recognition of the links to and the contribution to those areas of policy need to make to fulfilling the policy we have, have defined as a, as a new approach to fuel poverty eradication in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. And Norman Kerr. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think what we do know is that government have said that there will be uh, £500 million over the lifetime of the Parliament and very crudely that equates to £125 million a year, which falls far short of both the existing Homes Alliance call and indeed Energy Action Scotland's call, um, which was made some time ago of £200 million a year. Um, I think both existing Homes Alliance and Energy Action Scotland have fallen into the, the trap that we've accused government of, because those figures focus solely on energy efficiency of homes. They don't take into account the other things that we've talked about, behaviour change, advice, um, social uh, care, etc. What I will say is that both um, Existing Homes Alliance and Energy Action Scotland, as small bodies, um, do not have the resources of the Scottish Government, but our figures have never been challenged by the Scottish Government, um, which me leads me to believe, as we've said in our written submission, that either our figures are grossly underreported, um, or the government um, has a view of our figures that says it's too big and it's too scary. Um, what Professor Sigsworth has very um, well put is, we know from the last 15 years of experience, the budgets have not been enough, um, and we need to see significantly more. I don't expect um, any more than 125 million when the budget is announced. But I do know it needs to be significantly more than that. And using the existing Homes Alliance figure, it has to be double that. I don't think we will achieve that. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I just wanted to double, double check your figures. I know we've had four year parliaments in the Scottish Parliament, but I think the position we've moved to now is uh, five year parliamentary terms, and you referred to a 500 million figure? And we, for the next four years. Right. So okay. last year, I don't think it's counted in that 500 million. Thank you very much. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, we'll move to John Mason now. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and thanks for your comments so far, which have been helpful. Um, I mean, my understanding is that to eradicate fuel poverty, we've got broadly these four uh, areas that we need to be looking at, which is income, price, energy efficiency, and how we use energy. Now, given that at least two of these income is pretty largely out with the control of this parliament and fuel prices internationally are pretty much out with control of this parliament. If something happens in the Middle East, we can't do a lot about it. So given these are so central, sh should we even be setting a target to em eradicate fuel poverty, given that this parliament will never be, be able to really enforce that? The parliament set a target to eradicate child poverty. Um, and in eradicating child poverty, again, it, you don't have... Uh, power over income or social security benefits, <coughs> but you've set a target to eradicate child poverty. It would seem um, strange not to set a target. How can you measure progress if you don't have a target? And the measuring of the progress is just as important as the target. And I don't think anybody here is saying that target's got to be achieved within the next five or six years. We recognise that that may well be a longer term target, but unless you have a target, then you, you've no way of knowing how you're working to that end. What we can say is for the powers that the Scottish Government do have, that by the energy efficiency of the housing stock, that should not be a contributory factor to fuel poverty. Yet in Scotland, we still have homes that are F and G rated in terms of EPC bindings, that you, quite frankly, you would need a ludicrous amount of income to heat adequately, but those homes house the, who, the poorest people in the worst housing conditions. Scottish Parliament has the ability to sort that to ensure that those homes do not contribute to fuel poverty. So I, I don't accept that because you don't have um, an impact of, over global energy prices or social security um, that you can't actually set a target. Right. I mean, the... the Westminster target for eradicating child poverty meant to leave 10% of children in child poverty. So uh, eradicating can sometimes mean it may not be 100%. So, I mean, I suppose I'd be interested, do you think, do panel members think it should be 90, 95? Does eradicating mean 90, 95 or 100%? Um, I mean, the other factors in there. I mean, my understanding is that 19% of people in fuel poverty are in adequate housing, so it's not the housing that's the factor. There must be other factors in there. So I suppose, I mean, I'm really not suggesting that we don't have a target at all, but I'm just wondering if the target should be more on the energy efficiency, the quality of the housing, as you've emphasised, or whether it should be on this whole broad fuel poverty. I think it's got to be Sorry, broad, Mr. sorry. Um, no, carry, carry on, Mr. Kerr, and then I think each I, of our got panel think members It's, it's got to be in. broad because there are other things within uh, the both reports that the Scottish Parliament can do. It can engender competition. In many rural areas, as Di Alexander alluded to earlier, there is no gas. What there is is solid fuel, oil, LPG, and other fuels. And in some areas, there is no active competition. There is a monopoly situation. Um, the Scottish Government can do something around that by creating competition and active competition in those rural areas. It can also support the growth of uh, organisations like Our Power, where we've got community buying of, of, of energy to drive down the cost of that energy. So we can we can break the the energy market as it stands just now and introduce more effective competition. The Scottish Parliament can also, um, and we've talked a number of legislative opportunities coming forward under a Warm Homes Bill, can support the growth of combined heat and power, um, which again has been proven to deliver more affordable energy prices within homes. So there's a lot that's within the gift of the Scottish Parliament. Um, but to go back to your first point, you know, would we accept 90% reduction, 95% reduction? No, I think the target has got to be 100% reduction. 
that's the ideal. I think in 10 or 15 years' time, we can debate the remaining 5%, um, but I think any target has got to be about 100%. Um, thank you. Perhaps a, a quick question from Gil Patterson. That point, because we know that last year, I, or this preceding year, I, we've had a reduction of almost 100,000 uh, uh, people into, uh, out of uh, fuel poverty. But when you analyse the figures, 50% of that is due to the reduction in fuel. So it would suggest that if fuel goes up, and it looks very likely in this next coming year, that what's going to happen is the, the, the target is going to be blown apart. So would it not be better, which we have absolutely, there's no control within this parliament or government to do. So therefore the things, just like what John Mason was saying, should we not be really looking actively at the things that we do have control on and we want to make the change to and focus in on that element? Or do we need sort of a, to, yeah, I mean, we, we talked about the target originally that was set away all those 15 years ago, but coincidentally, since then, we've had a financial crisis, we've had austerity, we have, we've had, you know, all these things impacting on the poor and on budget. So, is it not is it not the wrong thing to do to set a target that's globally where we have no control? And rather than target into where we should be, that might really, you know, show that we are benefiting. And in selling, when you start putting money into something and you start moving, there's a tendency for it to follow. Whereas if we keep reflecting back the way and say it's a failure, a failure, a failure, within these figures are some actual, uh, you know, good numbers. Perhaps we could bring the other panel members in. Um, perhaps Di Alexander, then Elizabeth Leighton, and. Um, we do need targets. The targets, the, ta the, the key target should be about affordable warmth outcomes. <clears throat> if the Scottish Parliament can measure the progress that is made to achieving an improvement in the number of homes that are uh, taken out of unaffordable warmth and put into affordable warmth, the better. Um, and that is the only way to really, um, it seems to me, to be able to proceed um, meaningfully in terms of being able to assess whether such policies and programmes as the Scottish Government is able to put in place itself are actually working or not. That would be my view. Um, in relation to the question that um, Mr Mason's question, uh, that little can be done about fuel prices um, um, and, and incomes, it seems to me that uh, um, I, I touched earlier on the link between fuel prices and income. In other words, if you can um, uh, help people to achieve um, lower bills, then you put more money back in their pockets. Uh, money which in some cases will actually go towards, um, because people self-disconnect when they can't heat their homes. I mean, this is the reality. I've visited a number of projects and the actual stories that you hear about real live households here and now in this month that we live in, the amount of money that they're spending, the tiny incomes that they have and what they do in those circumstances is, is quite a lot of them self t t turn the heat off. So that's another aspect to the the question was raised there, but it, it seems to me that we can do, uh, but the energy carer approach, which I was outlining earlier, is about um, putting professional and trusted support into the homes of the particularly vulnerable households and particularly off-gas areas where we know that fuel prices are particularly high. And so, um, given changes to the way that people use their electricity and the so uh, use their heat uh, domestic energy and and the sources of dom domestic energy which they choose to use um, great savings can be achieved um, the competitions and market authority last year completed their biggest ever investigation into the 
energy mar into the electricity energy market, and they found that electricity, which is used as an alternative in the absence of gas by an awful lot of people living in Scotland, but particularly in remote, in rural and remote Scotland, that um, where they use it for heating, that in fact most customers aren't um, ever, they, they don't switch. 85% of all the customers on time of use tariffs in the north of Scotland have not switched. Um, and, uh, and remain with a predominant local supplier, SSE, in the north of the hydro, as it is known. And the same is true in the south of Scotland with Scottish Power. Um, the figures are slightly less. Um, if they could be helped to find another provider, uh, helped to get onto a standard, uh, to get away from a standard variable tariff or a time of use tariff, onto uh, and get basically what is a 10, a 10 p a unit tariff, which you can get by switching rather than paying an average of 15 p, they will save hundreds of pounds a year. So that is the kind of initiative which the I believe that Scottish Government can um, uh, take on board and show leadership on in terms of achieving a reduction in fuel prices for those households which are fuel poor and thereby put money back into their pockets and, it, uh, and, their, uh, and increase their incomes. Elizabeth Layton. Um, yes, I'll um, also respond to the question about um, you know, the limitation of, of powers and therefore perhaps limitation in what you might have as a target. I think the, um, both our work in the um, existing Homes Alliance, but more, um, I'll more refer to the Strategic Working Group report, it's made uh, made the case that actually, you know, we could be Scott, the Scottish government could be much more ambitious in its uh, its view or how it views its powers in relation to how it can increase incomes and how it can address energy prices. Of course, there are there are restrictions in terms of uh, the reserved powers. However, we we pointed to both short term and more medium to longer term. Um, issues that could be addressed. I think what Di has referred to is some of the more short-term. There are immediate things that it is just a no-brainer as to, you know, why aren't they being done now, particularly as we now have the remedies through the Competition and Markets Authority report. But especially now when we're on the cusp of these new powers coming into play for incomes, I already mentioned the opportunities to have a review of the broader set of Social Security benefits and look at those with a fuel poverty lens and say, you know, are there cases where some of discretionary housing benefit, for example, if you're in a house that, or your condition is such that you require additional warmth needs, shouldn't that be adjusted? If you're on ill health and disability benefit, again, if you have additional needs in term, or additional costs in terms of affordable warmth, isn't there an opportunity there to adjust that benefit such that you're addressing the income needs? And the other aspect of income is, as we've talked about with some uh, national infrastructure priority, what an opportunity. We can be creating jobs and businesses all over Scotland. It's not just a, a, f a fourth crossing with jobs in, in Queen's Ferry or right here in the Central Belt, but these are jobs that will be in your communities all over Scotland. And that's a way to, again, address the income question. On energy prices, we've made recommendations in the Strategic Working Group report about alternative models of energy supply. And some, we gave some examples, such as in the Western Isles with Hebrides Energy, where the, the council there is setting up an energy supply company that can provide energy, renewable energy, so also addressing climate change issues at a more affordable price. The Scottish government's already supporting the initiative Our Power working with social, uh, social housing and RSLs, but again, providing energy at a lower cost. So there are many opportunities where we could look at it a different way of providing energy that, that is more affordable. So I think, I think we could you know, stretch our, flex our muscles a bit and be more ambitious and not abdicate our responsibilities in terms of those two other um, drivers of fuel poverty. Um, Professor Sigsworth. I think most things have been said, but I would like to reinforce that, um, you know, thinking that we can't influence income 
because at the moment it's a reserve power. Um, the social security aspects is soon going to come under our control and give us some flexibility. And I particularly think that the investment in programmes such as the energy efficiency programme, we've got good research uh, that tells us that injecting money into those programmes will give some of the fastest responses that are available um, in terms of a kickback into the economy and particularly into local economies where we can put more money into people's pockets, as we've been said. And I think that's how I would describe the income issue. How can we put more money into people's pockets? We may currently have a, 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 a reserved uh, power that's stopping us doing it in some areas, but some things are coming. But other areas, for instance, are to look at construction techniques and the houses that we're actually building and the houses that we're refurbishing. Because during our investigation, we went to see sites in the borders where low energy housing that we believe constructed locally um, would not be that much more expensive than traditional housing. And these were passive housing standards, mechanically ventilated, but these were running. You know, we've already talked this morning of, uh, of £1,200, £2,000 for, uh, for heating, hot water and lighting in a home. We were seeing homes that were providing heating, hot water and lighting for £100 a year. So, you know, when we talk about putting more money into people's pockets, that to me is an income effect as far as I'm concerned. It may not be the absolute uh, tight definition of what reserve powers are in terms of income. That's how I see it. And similarly on energy prices, you know, all the things we've already raised, yes, we can't actually dictate international energy prices and we don't have the power over Ofgem at the moment to look at gas and electricity pricing to the extent that that's regulated. But there's a lot we can do. You know, we've suggested more community support to eradicate fuel poverty. One of those things will be local casework to help individual households make the changes that Di's talking about. The remedies that the CMA actually brought forward on removing restrictions on certain types of tariffs and certain types of metering would do that. But particularly, if we look at community energy, we have the situations in rural and isolated areas of Scotland to benefit remarkably from more affordable, more alternative energy supplies, particularly renewable and sustainable sources. And we should be, and the, we've already got good programmes in Scotland. We just need to do more and be more successful. Um, thank you. Two brief supplementals, first from Gillian Martin and then from Liam Kerr. Uh, yeah, I should also declare that I recently accepted the honorary <coughs> vice presidency of the Energy Action Scotland Board. Um, I was, when you were speaking about some of the, the good practice that you've seen and things that have actually worked in terms of uh, programmes, other northern European countries don't have the same level of fuel poverty that we do. Are there any examples that you can point to for other countries that have got similar climates? have actually done to, uh, to reduce their fuel poverty that we could look at? Do, uh, so in terms of the, the northern, you'll be referring to some of the Scandinavian countries, is because they took a dis decision long ago that they were going to, um, in, in Denmark, invest in district heating so that they could provide affordable energy that would be low carbon into the future. And that, again, has been a steady um, energy strategy for since the 1970s. So it's provided the certainty, the stability for investment, and there's been all the planning regulations and laws such that it, it all the time was facilitating. It was presuming that that was the direction of travel. Haven't had that sort of steady policy here in Scotland as part of the UK. And also they have um, had very high standards for house building, which came later here. So they've been able to enjoy the benefits of that. And there's also a, a cultural um, attitude of people who value high energy efficiency in their homes and they, they take pride in it and they invest in it. And you see that in Germany as well. And that's one of the reasons why the Existing Homes Alliance supports the idea of, of regulation um, of setting a minimum standard of energy performance, quite 
quite a, you know, a minimum, a lower one, to make sure that those Fs and G properties that we have on the market now will be a thing of the past. Because, you know, set, if you live in a F or G rated property, 70% of those households are in fuel poverty. And if you have that kind of market initiative, then you'll see a transformation, I think, in, in how people value and how the industry, property industry values um, properties that based on energy efficiency, I think, which would be a, a positive move. So I think it's, uh, it's a combination of um, government intervening to, um, to influence the market, but also letting the market respond to those signals in terms of investment and, and valuing energy efficiency. Thank you. Um, Professor Sigsworth. If I could just follow on, I mean, we have, the, there is in the appendices to our report some reference to the things um, Elizabeth Layton has just said. But I think there's also an acceptance that many of the changes we've alluded to in our report in terms of providing solutions and providing for disadvantaged families are already at the heart of social policy, particularly in Scandinavian countries. So I think the route to much of that is already mapped out and part of our report. And I would agree that it, that looks like good practice because in many of those Scandinavian countries, they, you talk about fuel poverty, it's just not recognised. It's not part of society. Thank you. And Liam Kerr. <clears throat> Thank you. It's just a very small supplemental arising from Gil Patterson's question, actually, that uh, is there a fundamental problem with the definition of fuel poverty, given that uh, at any given time one might be in fuel poverty, uh, but then if certain factors change, certain conditions change, one could come out of fuel poverty? And so I take Norman Kerr's point that if you set a 100% reduction target, for argument's sake, let's say you hit that, uh, the following year the economic circumstances could be such that a load of people fall back into fuel poverty. Uh, so is it, perhaps uh, Elizabeth Layton, I think you mentioned earlier or alluded to, it, is it better to set a target such as all homes should be EPCC rated by a certain time, or something like that. Is that the solution, or do we just need to look again at the definition of fuel poverty in general? Well, I'll, I'll answer the, the question that you've put to myself. I think it, that the target for the SEEP program, for the National Infrastructure Priority Program, we have suggested that there be an ambition or a target set for that program of EPCC over, over 10 years. Over time, that will have to go even higher as we're attempting to meet our climate change targets. However, I don't think that's sufficient in and of its own in terms of addressing fuel poverty. We've all been very clear about that, that, that it won't be enough to have properties at a, at a very good, at a C rating, that you would need to address these other issues as well. But it is true that people do can come in and out of fuel poverty, which is why it is so important that, that the interventions are attempting to, to future-proof yeah. The policies, but also the, the local economies, such that the risk of that happening becomes less. And the local partnerships approach that we talked about will intervene um, to support people before they fall into fuel poverty. So they're not just identifying people who are in fuel poverty already, but they're seeing, well, at point of discharge from hospital, they might be at risk. At, um, we, there's an example of the Macmillan improving the cancer journey program that some of you might have heard of, where the NHS has worked with Macmillan and with Energy Advice Services and uh, the Council to provide support to all cancer patients to say, you know, what are your needs? But it's a holistic needs assessment, so it's preventative. What needs do you have? And, and energy use is part of that. So that's, that's part of that approach is to, to prevent people going into fuel poverty in the first place by addressing all of those needs. Um, Professor Sigsworth. I mean, I, I think that some of the other case history w w that um, examples that we've included um, actually reinforce that because, you know, some of the situations when people move across that band um, are cancer patients, for instance, who suddenly come to a position where they need warmer temperatures and they occupy their house for longer. But 
we know that when people are moving on to benefits from work, you know, there's this extended period, I believe it's up six to six weeks. weeks, when they're receiving, you know, there's an assumption that their last monthly salary will tide them over. There's, you know, we saw talking to uh, the local authority in Fife that they've got good experience of that not being the case and they're taking preventative action to stop people crossing that line and they have measures and those case histories are all in the report. Di Alexander. Um, in response to Mr Henry's question, I mean, I, I think that the uh, it, it is worth looking at the fuel poverty definition, but that it, I think, it is works pretty well um, in the meantime. Um, and the key thing for me is that any new definition should be about affordable warmth um, um, rather than, than fuel poverty. It's the same thing, but it's expressed differently. Um, I do think that... Um, there are problems generally about the indicators and assumptions upon which the fuel poverty definition assessment is made, and we have an illustration of that in the latest Scottish House Condition Survey figures which have just come out, um, where the uh, rural fuel poverty has apparently dropped by 15% from 50% in one year. Well, you know, it just isn't credible on the basis of the evidence which we took in the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force over the period of the last year. Um, uh, the, uh, 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 there has been, a, a, during the period of the Scottish Housing Condition Survey, a, a marked drop in the domestic oil price, but you will be aware, but it's very short term. The oil price, domestic oil price, is particular, uh, and domestic oil is relied on heavily in off-gas rural areas, which is most rural areas, uh, as well as electricity. Uh, the, the domestic oil price is, is uh, oil price is particularly volatile, and you will be aware that the OPEC countries have just decided to get together again and control the oil price uh, on top of all the other factors which influence the oil price. And uh, the evidence, which is included in the Scottish House Condition Survey report, the latest one, shows the shows the graph coming up from an all-time low very, very steeply back upwards. So it is very important in terms of the way that we monitor um, fuel poverty, that we look at the underlying assumptions and, and build those in to any, um, it seems to me, government report which says that there has suddenly been a, a dramatic drop in rural fuel poverty, which there ain't been, if you look at the evidence that is coming from places in the Western Isles where they have surveyed uh, um, thousands uh, of households to look at their fuel poverty needs. Uh, the Scottish House Condition Survey is 2,750 households of which 20% were rural. It's a very small sample indeed and it does not include remote rural Scotland. So please can we have an improvement not only in the fuel poverty definition in time, let us work at it and get it right, but also in all the indicators and assumptions which underpin it and incidentally which also underpin things like RDSAP and the Scottish indicators of multiple deprivation which the SIMD people themselves recognise treats rural Scotland unfairly. Thank you. Um, Professor Sigsworth, you, yes. Um, I would agree with Di that the current definition has stood the test of time and shouldn't be swept aside uh, without a lot of deep thought. On the other hand, a big part of our work was to look at the definition. And it was clear to us that in terms of finding the home for what resource Scotland puts into trying to improve um, the, the lot of those in fuel poverty. The current definition is very imprecise in terms of identifying those in the most need. And it focuses on income and prices and ignores other aspects of vulnerability, and that's a big issue. But I think in terms of um, thinking about reviewing it, I'd agree that we have to change 
to a focus that isn't based on theoret theoretical uh, conclusions. And all of the conclusions in the uh, Scottish House Condition Survey is, are based on statistical analysis, which is distant from reality. Now, I'm sure that's not good news to you, but, th but you know, when you actually talk to academic and industry participants, there is the fabric issue of the properties and whether or not that is correct. And I'm talking now about people like building research establishment. I'm talking about senior academics who are in this sector of the business. And, but there's also the fact that when we look at the supposed um, consumption statistics within those properties, they, they in no way match the results that we see when we actually monitor what happens in those homes. So, the, you know, yes, I want affordable warmth and energy use to be at the heart of any future definition. I want it to be easy to understand and measure. I want also a recognition that affordable energy use is a basic need for healthy living and for participation in society. We need to recognise that in how we resource the, um, uh, the solution. And that income criteria that we're looking about baking into this has to encompass, in my view, the costs to meet basic needs. But I would say that there's this statistical analysis that we hang on with and has produced some of these, um, uh, you know, strange statistics and strange changes. Um, but as well as looking at its direction and changing to something that's easier to understand, we should also be looking at its statistical base. Thank you. Norman Kerr. Thanks, Chair. Um, two points. Um, I'm, I'm sure the Scottish Government can um, stick up for their own house condition survey team. Um, but I think we need to be quite careful here that whatever methodology we use, we will continue to use proxies, given that we have a nation of 2.5 million households we cannot survey every single one of them every year. So there will continue to be proxies, and while that's rural proxies or off-gas grid proxies or income proxies. So we need to be very careful about those measurement tools. Um, and there is a cost implication. Um, the House Condition Survey was every five years. That's now a rolling survey in our houses done every year. Statistically, it's reasonably valid, um, and there's not a huge amount of error in it. There will be because of the the size, some anomalies, and I recognise those from both Di and from, from David. And it may be at some point in the future the committee would like to look at the measurement tools that we use to understand how well our housing stock and our social impact um, is, is happening. Um, and, and I think that would be useful. The point that I really did want to make, though, was around affordable warmth. We've talked about that a couple of times. But I think Professor Sigsworth um, nailed it when he talked about affordable energy use. We can't just focus on affordable warmth. Um, heating and hot water takes up 60% of the bill. The other 40% comes in lighting, appliance use, and all of those things. So if we're, if we're looking at a measurement, we can't simply adjust fuel poverty to cover heating and hot water costs. We can't ask people to sit in the dark and not put the radio on. So I think we're talking about affordable energy use, not necessarily just affordable warmth. So in terms of the terminology that we've got around, I think we need to be very clear that it's not just, as I said, about heating and hot water. It's about energy use within the home. Thank you. Uh, we'll now come to Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, we've spoken uh, already about uh, vulnerable groups. One of the things that always strikes me uh, in these surveys is the uh, extent to which pensioner households are in fuel poverty. I think the figures are generally around about half of all pensioner households in Scotland live in fuel poverty. Um, um, so I wonder whether you could reflect on that and, and, and uh, perhaps give us any ideas, uh, maybe with a financial price tag if necessary, but give us some ideas on what can be done to address that problem in particular. Norman Kerr. Adopt the Hill's definition of fuel poverty for England. It took four million pensioners out of fuel poverty overnight. <laughs> I, and I think that's just simply, it may be sound flippant, but it's a word of caution on definition. 
and about un unintended consequences. I think we need to be very careful when we talk about pensioners. It may not just be the income of the household itself. It's about whether or not that, that person is living in a four or a five bedroom family home. The family have gone, they're on their own, the house is too big. They will never afford to heat it on a, on a pensioner's income. It's about whether or not they're on the right tariff. So I think there's a lot on the social side that we can do, as well as ensuring that we have adequate um, levels of housing for vulnerable people and not just pensioners. So th there's a lot we can do, but yes, pensioners in particularly rural communities are more vulnerable um, on that. I don't have a magic wand, but I do know that we, we can ensure things like um, cold weather payments. Um, we may want to adjust, and again, Scottish Government will have the opportunity to, do, to look at that, whether or not you adjust that for single pensioner households, for example. Um, you may want to look at when that kicks in. Um, just now it's seven consecutive days where it's zero or below. You might want to reduce that to three. You might want to up the level of payment that's made. There are a whole range of things that you, you might want to consider that supports vulnerable households. And I think, you know, we, we do talk about pensioners quite a lot, but I think we need to think about who else do we mean by a vulnerable household. And that may well be, and we've heard about Macmillan, somebody with um, a long-term health condition that's just as susceptible um, to uh, poor housing, to cold housing, uh, as pensioners are. Di Alexander. Um, Convener, there is a particular problem um, faced by pensioner households in rural and remote rural Scotland. Um, we have uh, higher numbers uh, and they're more likely to live in detached properties and more likely to live in older and larger detached properties, as Norman has po uh, pointed out. Um, and I think really the, the, the approach to helping pensioners is... Um, has to be, it has to be based on someone going into their home and who can be trusted and who has the knowledge to, be, to help them look at all aspects of what it is that's causing them to um, live uncomfortably in their home and actually make sure that everything possible is done in terms of heating systems, in terms of tariffs, and the changes that need to be made. Because you, you can't realistically expect uh, uh, pensioner households to all go on the web and switch, necessarily. Um, speaking as a pensioner myself, uh, I only did it recently, and I'm meant to be, you know, <clears throat> up to speed on these issues. Um, so um, there are things like that that can be done. Um, I think that the problem of uh, pensioner households living in houses which are too big for themselves is a, is a really challenging one. And I think actually what it may come down to is creating what you might call um, warmth zones within the house. Again, on the basis of the skilled professional and trusted, locally trusted professional going in there and working out what can be done to achieve comfort within the property that they are in. Because it isn't just possible to wave a magic wand and get people to transfer into smaller properties which may be, you know, um, uh, owned by a housing association like the one I'm involved with. Um, uh, with the best in the world, you have limited stock. Um, and uh, it is those kind of initiatives, but it does all come back to how you actually get to, the pro to grips with the problem at local level. And if you get in touch get to grips with a problem well at local level, you create other benefits uh, for the public purse on the uh, healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare grounds in particular, uh, and you also are helping to uh, increase um, local economic spin-off as well. And Professor Sigsworth. Um, during our investigation, uh, we looked carefully at this issue of why some of the people in the deepest despair on this front um, do not take advantage of 
the schemes that are available. And, you know, with two main thrusts, uh, we have the sort of area-based schemes where usually local authorities are uh, considering uh, improving energy efficiency across a swathe of property. And then we have uh, Warm Home Scotland, which is a relatively new initiative that's more focused. Um, what we found was that whilst the Warm Home Scotland programme has got much better, they've put a lot of resource into the sort of identification and solutions for these difficult um, to identify people. The people who we're really looking for in the deepest deprivation often a very reluctant to self-refer and so that's why i would say that the recommendation we have of moving the identification mechanism not the resolution mechanism the identification mechanism down into the community providing the correct resource and providing the correct training that to me would make sure that they know they told us they know the people that need the help, and that provides the link to get to the sort of solution that Di is suggesting. Elizabeth Leighton. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll just make a brief point about, um, and, and maybe a, a bit of a controversial one, uh, about winter fuel payments, um, because that is an, a new power that has come to the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government. Um, and our group discussed at length about how, you know, should we recommend a different way of, of distributing the, you know, who gets it, how it's, how it's um, paid out, uh, and didn't come to a firm conclusion. But we did agree that it's a substantial amount of money. It's about 130 million I think, a year. 80. And sorry, 180. 80. Oh, 180. Um, so even more. Um, which, when you think about the numbers we were talking about for energy efficiency and fuel poverty, you know, it's, it's vastly more so. So can we make better use of that funding? Is it going to the right people? Can we target it more effectively? But at the same time, making sure that you're not disadvantaging those who might be on the cusp, say, who might fall into fuel poverty if they don't get it. And so in the strategic working group report, it does recommend a review of the pros and cons of, of perhaps taking a different approach, and, but at the very least, make sure that there is joining up again. If you're getting some kind of a payment, if you're getting a cold weather payment, are you being linked to energy advice services? Uh, is that connection being made? It's, it's not now. So how can we make sure at the very least, if you're getting some kind of a payment, you're getting, this, you're getting an offer of support? Yeah. Would like, yeah, I think those answers are, um, are, are very helpful. I mean, I do reflect um, uh, to uh, Elizabeth Layton in particular, the written submission from the Existing Homes Alliance uh, talks at one point about the number of additional people who died last winter um, as a result of their uh, uh, poverty, presumably, and then you went on, it then goes on to refer to a World Health Organization um, study which suggests that uh, of those 30%, uh, may have died as a result of the the, um, the housing conditions in which they find themselves. So, uh, I mean, the, the figure you use is 2,850 people. 30% uh, of that is nearly 1,000 people. So um, I accept that there are vulnerable groups uh, and it's a broad spectrum of people, but I would have thought that of that number, quite a large proportion of those are pensioners, aren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Professor Sigsworth. Could I just draw to your attention, because I think it's very relevant here, that um, we did speak earlier about the linking together of various community resources, particularly primarily health care and social security local authorities. Um, you should be aware, if you're not already, that this week, I believe, um, the Scottish Health Information Network has actually issued advice to the directors of health in local authorities to actually suggest how our recommendations um, in uh, particularly about the community aspects and the recommendations in Di Alexander's group's report might be taken into their normal practice and a lot of the issues that we're looking at about how vulnerability is identified and dealt with 
um, is explained to the directors of public health. And along with it, um, on the web, I noticed an explanatory note by Dr. Phil Mackey, who is a member of the Fuel Poverty Forum. Um, and he describes in great detail in that note, I think some of the links you're searching for there about um, excess winter deaths and that sort of thing. It's really worth reading, both of them. Norman Kerr. Just to say that, that I think is why it's important when we go right back to the very beginning, we we're talking about bringing the NHS into fuel poverty because those excess winter deaths, when you examine them, they are not hypothermic deaths by and large. They are deaths from heart attack, stroke and other bronchial illnesses. And it's important that when we've got a health service that fixes people up, they send them back into the, exactly the same home environment that made them ill in the first place. So it's joining up that, and as, as David said, Phil Mackey's done a huge amount of work on that to give information to directors of public health, that it's about ensuring that when you're sending someone home, you're sending them into a warm home environment, and it's not the cold, difficult environment um, that, that brought them there in the, in the first place. Um, and that is... I think well documented now, but it's just getting back to the ownership. Can we get NHS to take ownership? It's not just about fixing the broken hip or giving inhalers. It's actually about understanding what's happening at home and ensuring that home is a warm, safe place for people to be cared for and to be thriving in that community. Thank you. Um, a brief supplementary from Andy Whiteman, and then we'll move to questions from Gordon MacDonald. So it's not a supplementary, convener. Oh, sorry. Well, we'll take your question now. Okay, um, very good. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming along this morning. Um, you've hinted that the budget we might see in, in uh, later this week may not be meet your ambitions. Um, well, on that assumption, what, what would your priorities be within the existing budget, based on your experience to date, about how to spend the existing money better and more effectively, um, and not just spending existing money more effectively, but both your reports have a a large number of recommendations, none of which appear to be in any sense prioritised or give any sense of, of the contribution each one would make to tackling the problem in relative terms. So what other measures are there? I mean, I'm drawn to Recommendation 29, the Strategic uh, Working Group, on the regulations for minimum energy standards at point of sale and rental, for example, which would be a regulatory thing, which wouldn't in itself cost the government anything, but if that was a priority, it, it, uh, it might achieve uh, quite a bit. So what would your priorities be within assuming that you're not going to get the spend you're looking for? And the second question is, has there any work been done on the economic benefits of doing this? I mean, you stress them, you make it quite clear, but I haven't seen any numbers on the, the upsides of making the kind of investment you talk about, the kind of payback in terms of jobs, in terms of the uh, economic growth, if you like, the amount of money that's in the economy that's not being spent on energy. Um, Elizabeth Leighton. Okay, I'll, um, I'll answer the second question first in terms of the, the payback. Um, that is research that we have, we have done and drawn on research that was done at the UK level that assessed what would be the macroeconomic benefits of, of a big stimulus package, a national infrastructure priority approach to improving the energy performance of the housing stock. And, and it comes out very, very well in terms of value for money, value for money in terms of jobs, value for money. We've talked about the health benefits and benefits to the NHS, so that's a, a savings that's achieved there for the budget. Um, value in terms of creating and sustaining local businesses. And, and you know, it's, it's been quoted by um, some economists um, from London School of Economics as, you know, it's, it's a shot in the arm as a, as a stimulus package. And indeed, we recognize that when the government announced its post-Brexit stimulus and you know, put another 20 million towards energy efficiency, only you know 10, which went to um, domestic stock. That you know that was a very positive thing. It, it was making the right noises, but a much bigger pa package, of course, could achieve much more. And it's not just spend, but it's also loans using the capital budget for low interest, zero interest loans for people to do energy efficiency. 
um, also pays back many fold, and that's been shown in the um, German economy about how they see it, you know, in a, in a sense almost as a money spinner, is that because it's paid back so well into the economy. So I think, you know, we've used the figures of eight to 9,000 jobs a year if the program is delivered at a sufficient scale. So, and again, this point about how it's, it's an, a piece of infrastructure that will be for all of Scotland, not just a piece of Scotland that gets a new hospital or a new bridge or a new road. It's housing that is an asset for our economy rather than a liability that is a drag on the economy because it's not performing well. Um, on the, the first question about how can we use the, this existing amount, you know, if, if it's going to be 250 million, the positive thing is that there is a multi-year commitment that was given in the program for government, so that's positive. It gives some certainty, even if it isn't um, sufficient uh, amounts. But as, as to how we could use it better, I've made the case earlier about how, yes, regulation, we think, would be an important um, lever in terms of bringing in private investment to match that public investment. And the more we can make use of those levers, be they incentives, um, standards, bringing in uh, planning conditions and such that um, facilitate the take up of <coughs> renewable and district heating, the more we can use all of those levers together, the more affordable the package will be. Professor Sigsworth. All I would like to add, actually, to that is that uh, I'd like to see some pilot schemes funded this year uh, from uh, that money or maybe some of the other budgets that I've mentioned that actually progress and don't leave on the table too long the good work that we've seen already. There are green shoots of this sort of work in local authorities in Scotland. I'd, see, I'd like to see them tested more strongly and more effectively um, throughout Scotland with some pilot schemes. Di Alexander. Um, <clears throat> th 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 our report um, does conclude with a list of uh, 10 um, um, key actions that could be taken in terms of the strategic approach. And of those, I would highlight, uh, again, the energy carer approach, which I've mentioned earlier, in terms of which it, it could be uh, roll out in the first instance as an extended pilot, um, in terms of actually getting to grips with the uh, problems of the most vulnerable households in the most disadvantaged areas. Um, uh, I would also highlight uh, again the problem of um, electricity uh, consumers um, and bearing in mind that in off-gas rural areas people rely much more heavily on electricity use about helping them to switch and save many hundreds of pounds. Um, and one thing I haven't mentioned so far is in relation to all the other um, forms of energy which people purchase is about setting up a non-transactional price comparison website where all prices can be compared on all tariffs charged by suppliers of all domestic fuels in all distinct market areas of Scotland. And we see an organisation like Citizens Advice Scotland as being the kind of organisation which could do that independently uh, and properly. Uh, in terms of the evidence of the economic uh, payback or the benefits, um, could I again um, say that you know I think that Scottish government um, should uh, could could help with that process by actually starting to measure the outcomes um, in properly. It, whatever they do, include that as one of the measures which you want to see reported back on. And then you will be, over time certainly, much better able to uh, see the trends and influences of the policies and programmes which the Scottish Government uh, pushes forward. Thank you. I'll move now to a question from Gordon MacDonald. Yeah, I was wanting to ask you about um, households that are in fuel poverty. Um, the the Scottish House Condition Survey was suggesting that 59% of households in full poverty were actually owner-occupiers. 
and uh, in addition, looking at the national home energy ratings, it says that the social sector, 82% of properties are good, including housing associations at 87%, but owner-occupied properties are only at 66%, and the private rented sector is only 65% are rated as good. So how do we encourage homeowners and um, landlords to actually tackle the condition of their building. I mean, we can put as many grants as we like forward and as many schemes as we like, but how do we encourage people as effectively private property to take up these grants and actually implement them? Norman Kerr. I think it's a very good point indeed. Um, if you look at successive energy company uh, energy efficiency programmes, the majority of them have been aimed at the private sector and they, they've gone in. If you look at the private sector in Scotland, a huge proportion of that has been right to buy, where people have bought their old council house, their old housing association house. Um, those folks are kind of asset rich but capital poor. They've not been able to uh, replace that uh, broken heating system or improve their windows or whatever. And indeed, a lot of the Scottish government programmes have offered grants in that particular area as well. So you're right, we've, we've offered carrots from 1996 to that particular sector. Sadly, that means the time for regulation has come along. Um, and if we're going to do that, then that's got to be through whether it's point of sale um, or it's some other uh, departure where we say to people, you cannot, we do it in the social sector, we, we're saying to housing associations and local authorities, you have an energy efficiency standard to meet, um, and we've placed a duty and a target upon you um, to do that, um, and if you don't do that, well, I'm not sure what the sanction would be, but we take a very dumb view of that, um, but we're not doing anything than that in the, the private or private rented sector. You know, I could set myself up as a landlord just now and put out a house that has no heating system in it and still get potentially a higher rent than a very energy efficient house in the uh, housing association sector. So I think we've got to come to a point very, very quickly um, where we say you can't either sell on a house or rent out a house because a lot of the private rented sector, many of them are incidental landlords. It's, you know, they bought a house. Um, when children were going to university, they've still got the house 20 years later, they don't know what to do with it. So it is about making that regulation rather than encouragement, because we have encouraged that sector for many, many years. So now is the time for regulation. If we're going to address it, regulation. Is that like an MOT on houses you're thinking about on yes, sale? Yes, uh, I mean we we already say. I mean if you if you go by uh, any estate agent's house just now and you look and you'll see house for sale and it'll give you the EPC rating of it, um, but it doesn't actually then say, well, here's what you should do to improve the energy efficiency of that. We could actually have an MOT and again set that whether that's a band C or a band D. I mean, why in this day and age should you be allowed to sell a home? Um, it's a band F um, home that somebody who may be able to afford the home but may, may not be able to afford to live in the home um, is, is, is the issue that they've got there. So it's the running cost of that that I, I, I think people don't understand and I don't think we make enough of it. Um, people are quite happy to buy a house because of location, proximity to school, proximity to work, but not actually take into account is it? And in the private rented sector, at the bottom end of the market, um, it's about the provider of last resort. That's where a lot of people end up, not because they want to be in the private rented sector, but unfortunately they can't get a house from um, a local authority or a housing association, or they can't buy their own home. So, Scottish quality home standard uh, into the private rented sector? That, that, that would be a very, very good start. Right. The other thing I was going to ask you was, uh, in relation to the energy efficiency programme, much of it has been spent on cavity wall insulation and loft insulation. But looking at the reasons why heating homes is difficult, 
uh, it's predominantly about boilers. Uh, are we doing enough in that, that, that area? Because it says poor and inadequate heating is more or less the number one reason for difficulties in heating home. This so is a doing point, enough in that area. This is a point that, that Dai made about houses off the gas grid. Yeah. Um, if you look at what drives a lot of the energy efficiency programmes, it's carbon saving. And the best way to get a big carbon hit is to replace somebody's central heating boiler. Um, if you live on a rural property and you're off the gas grid, there's no chance of you getting a gas boiler. If you replace an old broken electric system with a new energy efficient electric system, the carbon saving is close to minimum because an electric heating system is 100 per cent efficient <coughs> and based on the calculation, it doesn't matter whether it works or not, it's still 100 per cent efficient. And we've got ourselves caught up in this. It's all about saving car carbon. Um, Scotland has gone a long, long way to decarbonising its grid. Um, you know, we've only got one large thermal plant left in Scotland now. The rest is either wind or nuclear, um, and wind onshore and offshore. Um, we've got some pump storage, we've got hydro. We don't have a big thermal plant that is polluting anymore. But yet we're still taken with this idea that insulating somebody's loft um, will save a huge amount of carbon. In rural areas, it won't. And I think we need to recognise that. And it comes back to whether or not we're providing affordable energy to someone in those areas. And what I would also say to you is that the Minister has talked about the amount of homes that we've treated over a period of time. And if you look at that against the budget, we're not actually spending a huge amount of money in each house. And the thing that we've got that's cheap, cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, and a replacement boiler, when we know what we actually need to do is very deep retrofit, whether that's external cladding or internal insulation or a replacement of a heating system. So we've kind of tried to spread the jam and it's a never mind the quality fuel the width approach when what we should be doing is much, much more deep retrofit in areas and not just boiler replacement. Right. Um, I'd like to move on to a question from Ash Denham, and other panel members may wish to come back in on the last point from Gordon MacDonald in also addressing Ash's question. Hello. Yes, of course, some of the points have, have been covered. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that interested me from the action plan, and um, several of the panel have already mentioned them already, which is our power. Um, and they're actually in my constituency, and I, I've been to see them. And I think what they're, um, you know, what they're doing is is a really interesting and, um, you know, clearly filling a gap in the market, um, where they set out specifically to promote cheaper electricity to customers, you know, local authorities, social rented, so housing associations specifically, and to help those on prepayment meters who we know obviously are paying a much higher amount for their energy than probably they need to be doing. Um, so you said in your action point that um, all prepayment meter customers should have that type of support, whether it be from our power or, or something similar. What role do you see for the Scottish Government in you know, encouraging that or rolling that out more across Scotland? Uh, Di Alexander. Uh, I mean, uh, our power has uh, and is, has been doing and is doing tremendous work. And uh, as someone who's um, declare an interest, uh, not only a, a long-standing board member of a housing association, <laughs> which is a member or, uh, of uh, a supporter of our power, but also I'm on the board of SFHA, um, uh, um, more power to its elbow, so to speak. Um, the, the problem of prepayment meter customers um, who have had the worst deal of all um, fortunately, they have been highlighted by the Competition and Markets Authority, who have basically said y you, you, they now have to be treated uh, fairly, the same as the rest of us. Um, uh, so that is, that is a major step forward. But what our power are doing in terms of basically monitoring remotely energy use uh, by the most disadvantaged customers um, and which enables them to tell whether they may not be actually, if they're, if they're using too much electricity or if they're using far less than they should because they're self-disconnecting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's terribly important in terms of the kind of approach that we need, which is really focused on vulnerable households. Um, 
so um, uh, I'm uh, um, uh, a, a big supporter uh, of that approach and um, prepayment meter customers have had, a, have had a wretched deal and been treated abysmally uh, by the system in inverted commas uh, hitherto and they're just about to get a long deserved break. Any, got any more comments about the Scottish Government's role in... in uh, well, I'd, I'd add, add to that, that and the reason why we highlighted our power, as well as a few other examples, not just in Scotland, but in other parts of the UK, um, where local authorities um, and some charities have taken on the role of being an energy provider, and it's because, you know, their interest is in, is in the client, is in the householder, and not in the shareholder. And the Scottish Government has, we think, very much a, a role to play in supporting that kind of approach. And with my existing Homes Alliance hat on, I think it, it also serves climate change objectives, and community objectives, and you know business job support. And, and so there are lots of reasons for Scottish government to facilitate that, not just in money terms, which they have done with our power, but, but also to facilitate it in terms of, you know, it might be planning regulations, or it might be support in terms of capacity for local authorities, because they really struggle to set these up. There's a real skills and capacity gap in, in local authorities who are trying to do this, like say in Edinburgh, City Council have been trying to set up an ESCO for years. And it's hard, it's hard work. They're not, um, you know, they're not designed that way at the moment. And, and so there needs to be a transition to assist that. And other organizations like University of Edinburgh, which has combined heat and power, a lot of its um, buildings, but there's no, there's no incentive, there's no reason for them to broaden out, become a generator, a provider to others. And so they don't do it. And so it's a real missed opportunity of joining up the energy and supply and, and generation services. Norman Kerr. It's not just, I think, about things like our power. We've talked about citizens' advice earlier. Citizens' advice do a big switch campaign. But there is a huge amount of apathy about people wanting to switch, it's seen as being too difficult. Will I save a lot of money? Will I save £50? Is £50 enough to, to make me switch? Um, I think Scottish Government can continue to support <coughs> citizens' advice because that's where people will go at point of crisis. Um, but it's beyond that as well. I think it's ensuring that, um, for example, people know that just because you don't get your electricity from the hydro board anymore doesn't mean when the lights go out they won't come and connect you. So I think the Scottish Government has a lot to do in terms of its um, awareness raising. Um, it supports Home Energy Scotland and it will continue to support Home Energy Scotland. Um, but it's about continuing to put those messages out and I think there's a bit about consistency here. Um, so it's keep doing what we're doing but potentially do a bit more of it. Um, and look at who the other partners are. We can't create, you know, go on forever creating organisations like Our Power, but we can continue to support Home Energy Scotland, Citizens Advice, and people who will be the trusted intermediaries within communities who should promote that. And it's not sometimes just about changing supplier, it's about changing the payment method that you're on. Um, one of the recommendations that the CMA come up with um, which I'm not particularly a big fan of, is that if you've been on a standard variable rate tariff for three years with your supplier, they're going to give that information to other suppliers. Um, so there's a bit of a spammer's charter waiting to happen there. But it's a way of stimulating the market. It's how do you get people to actually feel that they're empowered to make decisions about the energy that they use and can actually save a lot of money. Um, some of the... the uh, information coming back from uh, energy advice providers, um, we've seen you know massive benefits. People saving five, six hundred pounds simply because they've been on the wrong payment method, the wrong tariff, and with the wrong supplier. And we're not suggesting everybody can save that amount of money, but a lot of people can save you know a hundred pounds or more by moving. Whether or not that's enough to convince them to move when you're spending, paying £1,400, you know, will £100 convince you to move? I don't know. 
Um, and I think there's a, a danger about the goal of let's have everybody switch supplier. Um, I think it's about ensuring that you've got the best deal. And that, I think, is a message that we need to continue to get across through those particular agencies that I've mentioned. Um, Professor Sigsworth and then Di Alexander. I'd just like to bring into this particular piece of the discussion the issues around unregulated energy, because the biggest challenge that we have currently in Scotland at the moment from a climate change perspective in, in our energy policy is we, you know, we've decarbonised, as, as Nori was saying, much of the electricity network. Um, decarbonising heat is a huge and bigger problem and that's that's well recognized now by the Scottish Government and I think what we'll be seeing as, as the new energy policy rolls out will address that but the thing is if we're going to take advantage and for instance um, every boiler that's using gas at the moment is an opportunity to decarbonize and there are some sustainable systems that use for instance combined heat and power that might be biomass or it might be uh, uh, fossil fuels. But the fact is that along with a range of other fuel sources, they're not regulated. And I think that it's we have to see those same strictures that CMA have tried to bring on the underprivileged in conventional markets into this new area. And I have to declare an interest because I'm a board member of an organisation offering voluntary regulation in this sector called the Heat Trust. But I know Scottish Government have already raised this issue in their forward thinking. But if we're going to make progress in district and community heating, finding a proper way of regulating that and making sure we don't get into these problems with the vulnerable is a big part of the consideration. Thank you. Di Alexander. Uh, I just wanted to add, convener, that the role of Ofgem in all this is terribly important. And um, they referred the energy market to um, the Competitions and Market Authority. Um, and um, the uh, Competitions and Market Authority have come back with their very um, compendious a list of uh, conclusions and recommendations. Um, and whilst they are making sure that the prepayment meter customers are going to get a much better deal, um, they haven't, um, uh, they are still hoping that the big electricity providers who are knowingly uh, charging uh, a great many of their customers who aren't switching, the great majority aren't switching. Uh, 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 a lot more than they should be paying if they switched. I, I would be looking to Ofgem to, and uh, I hope that Scottish Government and indeed the Scottish Parliament will look to uh, discussing with Ofgem how they are going to um, uh, look at this issue in the light of the CMA report and what action they may intend to take if, in fact, there is no progress in terms of getting a much fairer deal uh, for uh, their many customers who aren't switching, because it's long overdue. Uh, the CMA have said that there is a real issue there, and the regulator is in a position to do something about it. Is that a problem with the difficulty in switching suppliers for individual customers? I think that Norman has, you know, put, put his finger on it in the in the rural context. I mean, I live in the north of Scotland, you know, and the SSE is the main provider, the hydro, as everybody still calls it. And if the lights go out, uh, as they did with us um, the winter before last, and we were without electricity for three days, um, the the boys from the hydro come round in their in their Land Rovers, and they do absolutely heroic things. And you think, well, um, you know, how could I ever, uh, with any sense of decency and loyalty, switch my provider? In fact, that isn't what happened. It's a separate company. Although it has Hydro written over the side, it's a separate company. And they should, they are duty-bound to do it for whichever uh, uh, um, 
provider of electricity you have to be purchasing from. So um, there is, I think, an element of confusion in people's minds still about um, uh, what, what they take on uh, and what they give up um, by uh, abandoning the, the hydro or Scottish power in the south is the same issue. So I think there are issues there in terms of clarity. Um, but, I, but also, I think that a lot of people are just um, very wary about the difficulty, the, what seems like the apparent difficulty of switching. I mean, that is clear from the evidence which has been produced by the CMA and by Ofgem itself in terms of its own analysis. Right. Well, I think we're, we're coming towards the end of our session now. Um, Jackie Bailey, did you have a question you wanted to raise? Um, quite point. a specific one, but, but might I um, just observe that I recall the first um, statutory fuel poverty target and would just note that nobody objected then um, to it being a comprehensive target, despite the limited powers we have now. And obviously, Elizabeth Leighton and others have outlined some of the new powers coming. Um, I wonder whether you've done any specific work in the working groups to quantify the kind of changes you're talking about to housing benefit or you know, to disability living allowance, or is that work for phase two? That's the first question. And the second question, because I'm conscious of time, is I don't think we've touched on the energy company obligations, because, of course, you have... Well, we will have new powers, um, both to design and shape them differently. And at the moment, it feels a bit like a patchwork. So I wonder whether you'd offer your comments on you know, potentially £60 million of additional investment and how you would want to see that designed and implemented in the future. Well, perhaps we'll go from right to left to, to finish off here and start with Norman Kerr. I, I, I will leave the first part of your, your question to allow you, Professor Sigsworth and I to answer as holders of the report. Um, what I will say to you on the energy company obligation, um, that's a reducing pot of money um, because the changes to the energy company obligation have meant that the targets that the energy companies had have been stretched out um, further. And that was to try and reduce the burden on consumers' bills. What it did, in fact, was reduce the amount of help to vulnerable customers. So that 60 million we could have had as 120 million or, or more. So it's a reducing pot of money that we've got. When the Scottish government takes the control of that, I go back to what I said earlier. My plea would be don't make that based on carbon saving. Because if you do, then it will continue to be replacement boilers in the M8 corridor and it won't move out into rural communities um, where it's about affordable energy use, not carbon saving. So additional investment is welcome, but let's not make it all about carbon. Acknowledging that there will be a carbon saving, but that can't be the primary reason for insulating someone's home. It's got to be about are we actually giving them a better deal and reducing their energy costs. Thank you. Professor. I, I think I'd just like to reinforce what Norrie has said there, because there's no doubt whatsoever that if we finish up with eco and the money we get from eco having to be operated on a completely different basis from the schemes that SEEP actually are designed to deliver, that would be disaster. And I think um, we've got to use our ability, I hope, not only to have uh, you know, a request level of saying what we want to see that doing that is going to be a Scottish prerogative. But my understanding from officials is that our ability to actually influence the rules may be bounded by the bigger eco um, obligation. That's maybe my misunderstanding. But I wouldn't want to see eco and that 60 million or whatever the number is sort of channeled into something that doesn't work for us in the wider context. So that, 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 that's my first point. In terms of any work we did in shaping benefits, um, we had uh, several of the specialists on our group that were either uh, dealing with these problems on the ground or academically uh, uh, um, involved in them. And we haven't brought any of the detail into 
um, the, into our report because it, it was, but, but there's a lot of indicators on where we would like to see the pressure applied. And, you know, Elizabeth has um, mentioned one of them in particular, which is winter fuel payments and whether that could maybe looking forward um, be used more advantageously. In fact, um, yeah, if I can just add on that, uh, uh, on the benefits, as, as David has said, we didn't quantify that, but recommended that there was a review. But we gave some examples, and uh, another example would be how the mobility payment is used and how that, that can be kind of rolled up and then used for a larger purchase, in that case, uh, mobility, a car. You could look at, you know, how could that be applied in a fuel poverty situation. So there are you know, examples of doing things a bit more creatively and making better use of those those benefits to meet fuel poverty needs. On on eco, um, as as David had said, it's it's more complicated than it would seem. You know, wouldn't it be nice if uh, just a, the, that pot of money could have been added to the the program and been an integrated program? Um, but it seems it's not quite so easy. But at the least, we we did explore what options there were to at least move part way in that direction, and that there might be options to for the Scottish government to take on the responsibility to deliver um, measures for some of the suppliers who don't have a customer base or much of a customer base in Scotland. And it might be quite attractive for them, for the Scottish government, to deliver that sort of on a contractual basis as they can do between suppliers. So, so our push was to integrate as much as possible and not have ECO going off and doing its own thing, but it's part of the same program. And lastly, I just wanted to um, talk again about, you know, we were talking about switching and, and I was thinking of our local, the, I think one of our most radical and bold recommendations was about the local partnership approach. And, and it just shows how trying to look at switching in isolation or fuel poverty in isolation doesn't work for the people who are in fuel poverty because they probably don't even identify themselves that way. Um, but with the, with the partnership approach, you know, we had an example from Fife who's, this was a tenant, he's on a methadone program, suffers from depression, you know, th those are his issues. It's not, and he's self-disconnected from, from the gas service. And so he's worried he can't have his son come and visit on the weekends because the house isn't warm enough. So, you know, those are his problems. It's not about switching necessarily. So you need that, in this case, it was a housing management officer. So worked with the supplier to negotiate the repayments, had some, a special program of funding to help clear the debt, got the warm homes discount lined up, the local community intermediary came and installed thermal um, curtains, low energy lighting, draft proofing, so at least some basic measures are in place. And so now he's, he's a bit more on top of his life. He's registered for his methadone prescription again. He's got some food vouchers. He's cleared his debts. You know, he can sort of get back on track again. And, and so it's, it's needing to take that holistic approach, starting with their needs, rather than coming at it just, I'm here to deliver you a, a fuel poverty intervention. So I thought that was a, a useful example to show how that's where we think you'd, you'd spend to save. You'd, that would be the most effective use of government money. And finally and briefly, Di Alexander. Um, we didn't um, do much on benefits. Um, we left that to the strategic working group had enough to do. But we were very keen on the scope that winter fuel payments offer. Um, we think that that would be a fruitful area for Scottish Government and Parliament to have a look at. With regard to eco, um, the time for eco simply basically delivering low-hanging fruit energy efficiency measures should be over. And I think that from what I've read of the UK parliamentary discussions around that, um, they think that too, and it should now be targeting vulnerable households and affordable energy use without a shadow of a doubt, and let us hope that it goes that way. Thank you very much. Well, I'll thank all of our guests for coming in today, and uh, we'll now suspend the session and move into private session at uh, quarter two. Thank you very much. <laughs>